Um, our next session is from uh, Seth Varga, a developer advocate uh, from Google. And uh, we're going to be talking some secrets in serverless. So please give it up for Seth. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jeff and everyone else. Uh, cool. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, I have zero slides. I'm serious. This is the only slide that I have, and it's not even a slide. It's just my Twitter handle. Uh, feel free to tweet at me during the talk, after the talk. My DMs are also open. But this is, uh, like, this is a smaller group, so we're going to be a little bit interactive. We're going to write some code together. But what we're doing is we're following the hypothetical journey of this application that I've written. Uh, I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, please note that I have no design skills, so please don't make fun of it when you see it. Um, but this app has a few requirements, uh, the biggest of which is it needs to talk to a third-party data store, Redis in this example, but it could be any database that you might think of. And we have to find a way to get the credential for our serverless application to authenticate to our database. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow kind of a journey of very insecure to as secure as we can possibly be by continuously deploying and iterating on this application. So let's take a look at what the application looks like, and then we'll take a look at the source code under the hood. Like I said, not a designer. Uh, this is the application I've written. Uh, it's a very simple 1990s GeoCity site. Um, every time you visit the website, you increment the counter. Um, so every time I refresh here, we're incrementing the uh, visitor counter. And then because I'm an admin and I'm logged in, uh, I can reset the counter, and then it resets back to one. And again, every time someone visits this website, they'll get a new hit counter. And the way we're implementing that is on each visit to this website, the application makes a connection to a Redis database and increments a counter uh, in the Redis database. Very straightforward, lots of CSS and really good design, as you can all see. Um, and with that, let's take a look at the code. So the application is actually written in Go, which might be weird to some people. You're like, oh, you see serverless, and you kind of just assume Node.js. That's like the natural pairing that we make in our mind. But I've actually written this application in Go uh, for a number of reasons, uh, the biggest of which is I think it breaks the paradigm of what we think is serverless. Um, this is still an application that's going to scale independently, both horizontally and vertically. Um, it's going to be wrapped up in a container, so it could be any language or any runtime. But the key piece here is that our application needs some configuration. And to start out, I'm using environment variables to store that configuration. Specifically, I'm asking for the Redis host, which is the uh, IP address where the Redis instance is living, the port on which Redis is listening. Uh, and I'm just going to default those to localhost and 6379 if they're not specified. And then I have my Redis password, which I'm also passing in via an environment variable. And later down here, when we connect to Redis, we pass in that password to authenticate to Redis. So we are being super secure. We're not just leaving you know, a publicly exposed Redis with no authentication. Uh, we're putting a password on our Redis authentication. And we have to pass that into our application. So now when we want to deploy our application, um, I'm going to package it up and deploy it as a Docker container. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this container. Um, and then I'm going to push that container to uh, container registry. And then I'm going to deploy that application. Now, slight disclaimer, I'm using all Google stuff because that's why I work. And then I don't have to pay for it. Um, but all of this stuff is not Google specific. Like Everything is very generic. It applies to Lambda. It applies to Azure functions. It applies to OpenFast. Um, so if you see like G Cloud commands, it's not a vendor pitch. Everything here is very like cloud agnostic and vendor agnostic. Um, so we're building a container, we're pushing the container, and then we're deploying the container. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Or, sorry, I already did that. That's what you're seeing here. Um, and there's a few vulnerabilities that I've introduced into this application. And I hope to show you that storing plain text secrets and environment variables is literally never the right solution. Um, you should never store plain text passwords and environment variables. And let me show you why. So there's this fun reset the counter button. And every time I click that button, it resets the counter. Um, now, I was a security penetration tester in a previous life. So I'm going to actually like kind of inspect what this link does. And it turns out that this link just sets a count parameter uh, to this additional URL path reset counter. 
So I'm curious, what happens if I set the counter to like negative 100? Oh, interesting. There doesn't appear to be any validation on this endpoint. Uh, and oh, it's cool. The site still functions um, as, as intended. But what happens if I reset the counter to banana? Oh, crash the whole thing. Uh, and if you work in any popular web framework like Rails or Django, um, they run in this really helpful mode where, by default, uh, unless you set some extra configuration options, they'll give you these really nice debug pages for local development, which is like, hey, here's you know, the request URI I got. Here's all the packages. Here's all the, the system level dependencies. And here's the entire environment for the application. So we have this application. This is deployed publicly. You can actually hit the URL there in the browser bar. And we can see that our Redis host, our Redis password, um, and our Redis port are all just in there in plain text. And so reason number one why you don't want to store passwords in plain text and environment variables is that if you misconfigure your application, um, and it, I'm not trying to pick on any particular language or framework here, you, you run the risk of something like this happening, right? .NET had this for a very long time, where if you crashed .NET and it wasn't in production mode, it just gave you a full dump of everything. And that was actually the cause of a number of vulnerabilities for .NET applications, right? So we could fix this, right? We could set up CI CD pipelines to make sure that we always deploy with um, the environment variable production set to true, uh, or just set. Um, that's important. It tells us that we need to do that. Um, but the other thing we could do is we could just not store environment variables in plain text. So let me show you what it looks like if we fix this vulnerability. So I'm just going to come in here, and I'm going to add another environment variable to say env equals production. Oops. I'm going to save this, and then I'm going to deploy the application. And we built a new container, and now we're pushing up that container, and now we're deploying that container. Um, so it takes you know somewhere between five to ten seconds. It's a pretty fast development loop. Um, we route some traffic. We wait. We wait a little bit longer. All right, cool. And then we come back here to the browser and we refresh, and hopefully we get like a generic an error occurred, right? So we've patched the vulnerability. We can't possibly be vulnerable anymore. Um, we've added this check to our CICD pipeline, so there's absolutely no way we could ever leak the credential, right? You're supposed to say wrong. Um, so we've patched this vulnerability, but we haven't addressed an entire other surface area, which is a software supply chain attack. Um, so it turns out that because I wrote this application, um, there is a vulnerable package in this particular application. So if we jump back and look at the source code for this application, it's actually importing this package called Malice um, that, again, a lot of this is kind of fake. But you can imagine this being a direct dependency or a transitive dependency of an otherwise very helpful package that is doing something like trying to steal your you know, cryptocurrency mining or trying to take over your server or trying to execute arbitrary code. Uh, and we've seen a lot of vulnerabilities in a number of different language ecosystems that are trying to do this, where you just have an otherwise helpful package with a malicious dependency, either direct or transitive. And every time I deploy my application, this package is getting uh, included inadvertently. And you might ask yourself, well, what does this package do? Well, you could write like a very sophisticated um, uh, attack vector package that targets a user that tries to do something very specific. Or you could do what this package does, which is just dump the OS's environment and send it to a random HTTP endpoint. And you would be surprised how much information you can glean from just the request headers and the entire system environment. And this has been running every time we make a request, actually. So if we jump in here to our um, logs for this application, for our Malice application, you can see that every time we make a request, the entire environment is getting dumped up to this rogue HTTP endpoint. Um, and that obviously includes our Redis host, our Redis password, um, the Redis port, all of that information that was available in the debug output. We're also sending this to an attacker. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, like, oh, this isn't so bad. Um, you could mitigate this um, you know, doing x, y, and z. But this is actually like a publicly accessible uh, Redis instance. So I'm going to telnet into this thing. Um, and I can get ping, and it says, like, oh, auth is required. Well, we've thwarted every attacker. 
Um, I can off with my password, which is super secret, and now I can ping and I can get Pong. Um, and I can like, like I have full permission over this Redis server at this point. Um, and that's all because I leaked the credential or the authentication for talking to this uh, Redis instance in an environment variable. So hopefully now it's clear that I don't know how to exit Telnet. Um, cool. Um, hopefully now it's clear that <laughs> storing environment variables in plain text is a bad idea. Um, how many people, uh, be honest, do any of you know how to actually exit Telnet? It's really hard. You just close the terminal window and open it up again. Um, cool, so there's a few ways that we could mitigate this, right? Like we could implement vulnerability scanning, we could add CI CD checks, we could do a whole bunch of stuff, but all of those assume that the vulnerability has already been found, right? This is a challenge, which is that it doesn't matter how big your CVE database is, that only includes things that people have already found. We need to find a way to protect against attacks that haven't been found yet, or haven't existed, or been um, revealed in the wild. And that's where we can move to something like encrypted environment variables. So instead of storing the plain text environment variable, we store the encrypted environment variable, or the encrypted string in an environment variable. And then at boot, we decrypt that and store it in memory. So let me uh, take a look at what that looks like. So I'm going to run um, this fun encrypt string script that I wrote which encrypts um, the string that I give it with a key that's managed with a key management server. Again, I'm using Google's key management server, but you could also use Amazon or Vault or whatever key management system you want. Um, it encrypted it, and it gave me back this wonderful collection of Base64 encoded encrypted bits. And I'm going to give this over to my app. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to say that um, Instead of the Redis password being super secret, which is hard-coded directly, I'm just going to set the Redis password to this really big, long encrypted string. And then obviously, we also have to update our application so that it knows to decrypt that string before doing anything else. So I'll do that here in the main function. I'm just going to ask it to grab the Redis password. Um, and I'm just going to say to decrypt that. And if there's an error panic because this is a live demo and that's what I would do. Cool. So now what we've done is we've basically told our application, hey, when you boot up, go pull the environment variable, which is still in Redis pass, and decrypt that using KMS and then pass the plain text version in. So if an attacker has access to our environment variables, they're not going to see the actual plain text. They're only going to see the encrypted one. Uh, but in memory, and when we authenticate, we'll have the plain text one. And I'm actually going to jump back over here and take away MV equals production, just because it's easier to show you what the environment looks like in that case. So now let's jump over here to here. We'll run deploy app again. This is going to take a little bit longer, because it, I guess it's not going to take a little bit longer. And we're packaging up our container. We're deploying our container. We're waiting for our container to become healthy. And now it's routing traffic. And the goal is that the application doesn't change, right? Like the end behavior of the application doesn't change. I haven't edited any of my guest logic or my guestbook logic. Um, you'll notice here that like the Redis password is that really long encrypted string. But if we fix the counter, um, you can see that it's still the same perfectly functional application. Because at boot, only one time, only the first time the application was deployed, it took the encrypted string, decrypted it, and then it's using that decrypted value to communicate to Redis moving forward. Again, in our malice package, if we were to jump over here, um, that package is still in our supply chain. But as you can see, the uh, payload is exactly what we're seeing on the screen. It's the encrypted string. It's not the plain text string. So an attacker doesn't have the right permissions to decrypt this string and to get back the plain text value. Um, so we've, we've pretty successfully mitigated this attack. Um, there's a few challenges here. Um, the first is that we lose any centralized management of these secrets. Once we encrypt that string and put it in the deployment, we don't know how often it's being used. We don't know which applications are still depending on it. Um, we, get, we don't get a lot of like, auditing and logging out of it. 
Um, the second thing is that we're kind of relying on a key management system to do the encryption and decryption. So we've just pushed the security problem further down the stack, which is how are you authenticating your function to actually talk to the key management service? And how are you doing key rotation? How are you preventing um, like IV attacks and all of those things? So we, we just made the security problem kind of someone else's problem. Um, but encrypted environment variables are still astronomically better than plain text environment variables. In fact, you should like never use plain text environment variables ever um, for any type of password or credential. Um, so if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it's like, please don't put passwords in environment variables. Um, if I could get that on a t-shirt, I would. Uh, but t-shirts are expensive um, when you buy them just for yourself. Cool. The best way to actually secure this application is to not have a password at all. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, wait, if my app has to talk to Redis, like it needs a Redis password. Um, or if my app has to talk to MySQL, it needs a MySQL password. And that's not actually true. Um, you can, if you're, especially if you're on a cloud provider or um, some type of identity and access management system, you can delegate the authentication and authorization to some third-party system. So instead of your application needing a username and password to talk to MySQL, Instead, your application is authorized to talk to MySQL through like a cloud provider's identity and access management system. So anytime you're looking at, at a problem that you're trying to solve by injecting a secret into a serverless function or any application, you do need to take a step back and ask yourself, do I actually need a secret here? Or can I use like instance metadata authentication or some type of identity function in my cloud provider or my networking provider to do this authorization instead of injecting a secret into the runtime? If you can bring that one level higher, you make it a lot harder for an attacker to gain access and escalate privilege. One of the main drawbacks of encrypted environment variables, as I said, is that you lose that centralized storage, the centralized auditing and logging. So if I'm going into my secret store and I'm like, OK, we have the Redis password, who is using the Redis password? With this architecture, that's a really difficult question to answer. I don't know how many of these functions are using the Redis password. And worse, because of the way that most key management services work, you don't have convergent encryption, which means that the, even if you know what the password is, the same string will generate a different set of encrypted bytes every time. So for example, if I, if I jump back over here and I run the encrypt string function again with super secret, I get back a different string every time. It's not convergent encryption. So I can't just encrypt the string and then you know, search over all of my serverless apps to see, oh, which ones are using the encrypted string because it's not a convergent encryption algorithm. Most of them aren't. Um, so I lose the centralized management. And this is where the third kind of approach, if you consider plain text an approach, to secrets management and serverless actually comes from, and that's using a centralized storage system. So there's a few different centralized storage systems. For example, on Amazon, you have um, Amazon Secret Store or Amazon Parameter Store. Um, Azure has a thing called Key Vault. On GCP, you can use Google Cloud Storage, or you can use Burglass, which is what we're going to use here. But the general architecture is, Instead of having your application encrypt a string and then decrypt it at runtime, you actually store the secret material in a central place, like a storage bucket, for example, or a file system. And then at boot, your application accesses the secret from that centralized store. And the centralized store is responsible for all auditing, logging, alerting, anomaly detection, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to use Burglass, but again, super generic. Um, this will work with like any secret store really including the file system if you want to build it yourself. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this burglass command, um, which is super long, but I'll tell you what it does. Um, so I'm creating a secret. I'm, um, this is the name of a Google Cloud storage bucket. This is my Redis password. This is my actual password itself. And then I'm encrypting it with a KMS key. Um, so basically, I'm taking the string, encrypting it, and putting it in the storage bucket. And then I'm granting permission to my cloud function to um, oops, clear to access that particular secret. Um, so again, relying on identity and access management to control the authorization here. So I don't have to pass in an authentication token. I just authenticate the instance, and then it has permission. So there's no uh, exchange of credentials. And then back in our source code, um, instead of running KMS decrypt, 
we're going to run burglass access. And we will access the name of the secret, which was Redis Pass. And that's it. That's the only change I need to make. Oh, it's yelling at me because this isn't used anymore. Uh, that's fine. And we'll come over here. And we will run deploy app. And this is going to build a new container. It's going to build a new Go binary. This one's actually going to take a couple seconds. So I have to like blabber incoherently for another minute. Um, my favorite color is blue. I like sausage pizza. Pepperoni is OK, too. Um, if there's a question, I can answer that right now. Yeah, what's up? So the question is, what is it doing? Um, so I'm using, uh, I don't know if you were here from the very beginning, I'm using uh, Cloud Run to deploy. Um, it's similar to like Fargate, which is like, I'm building a container. So you see like the Docker context. So I'm building a container. Um, I'm using Go. So part of the build steps of building that container is to actually compile the Go binary. So where we spent the most time was actually on this step here, which was the Go build step. So I'm taking my Go source code, I'm compiling it into a binary, and then I'm putting that binary in a container, and then I'm shipping that container up, which includes the entire runtime that my app needs to function. Uh, and I'm telling the serverless runtime, which is just Cloud Run in this instance, to run that container. Cool, so that's done. Uh, it's successfully shifted over the traffic. And if we jump back over here to the app, we can see that it's still functioning as intended. So even though we've completely changed the underlying behavior of how the Redis password is getting injected into the application, the app still functions the same. We can still reset the counter. We can still come in here and um, oops, reset the counter. Um, I lied. We can still come in here and reset the counter to banana. And even though there's this Redis password environment variable in here, we're not actually using that anymore. Um, and to prove that to you, I will do what I was supposed to do during the initial deployment, which is remove the Redis password from here and run deploy again. Um, to further, further build on my answer to that question, this one will be super fast because we've already built those layers in the Docker container. We already have the container locally. We just have to push it up to the cloud, and now it'll just deploy it. So all future builds are super fast because the Docker layers already exist. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Still waiting. OK. And over here, our app is still functional. And we can reset the counter. And if I reset the counter to banana again, you can see that even though the Redis password is nowhere in our environment, we're still able to communicate with Redis. And that's because we're now using a secret store for that communication instead of relying on the environment variables. So the fifth pattern that I want to talk about is using an actual secrets management solution. So in this example, I'm using a storage bucket with auditing and logging and a bunch of stuff in the background to make it look like a secrets management solution. But there's also a lot of open source and enterprise secret management solutions out there, like HashiCorp Vault and CyberArk Conjure that are either free or paid solutions that act as this centralized secrets management storm. They do things like dynamic credentials, auditing, logging, anomaly detection, et cetera. So I just want to show you a quick sample of using uh, Vault open source for doing this type of secrets management, because there is a little bit more complexity that comes with it, because we can't rely on the built-in identity and access management of the cloud provider. We instead have to rely on Vault to do some of the authentication bits for us. Um, and again, I'm trying to be vendor agnostic. This would be the same as if you were using Conjure or any other secrets management solution. Um, the general principles still apply. So the first thing we need to do is actually configure Vault to be able to authenticate our serverless application. So our secret is just going to live in Vault's key value store. Um, so Vault, kv put, um, kv my app. Redis pass, and the value is super secret. So we've created this key value store in Vault, um, very similar to any other key value store. Um, and now I have to tell Vault, um, or I have to give Vault a policy that will enable my application to get this secret back out. Because right now, when I interact with Vault locally on the CLI, I'm kind of like the root user. But when we deploy our application, our app won't have any permissions by default. So we need to basically give it those permissions. And the way we do that is by creating a policy. 
So I'm going to create a policy called my app, uh, my app kv read, and I wrote this policy in advance, so I'll show you what that looks like. Um, it just gives the application permission to read from the key value store. And now is the fun part, which is we have to give our application, our serverless application, the ability to authenticate to Vault so that it can get the secret from Vault. The same way you'd have to authenticate to CyberArk so that you can get the password from Conjure. Um, and I'm going to do that by running, um, by enabling the GCP authentication um, plugin or backend in Vault. Um, so I'm going to run GCP serverless role, my app. And we're going to allow IAM login. So basically what I'm doing is I'm telling Vault, hey, you should trust Google's IAM system. Like, that's the source of truth for identity and access management. Um, my project ID is a, a Google-specific thing, DevSecCon Seattle 19. Um, my policies are my app KV read, and my bound service accounts is my app. This is the really boring part about this talk, because I have to type a lot. Seth Vargo, Dev, SecCon, Seattle, 19, and I am at that, I am the G service account dot com. And the max jot expiration is 60 minutes. Okay, did I make a typo? No, wow, that's impressive. All right, and the last thing I have to do is I have to come in here and I have to run vault access instead of um, uh, burglass access. And the path is KV data my app Redis pass. So we'll save that. And we will deploy this. So it's also going to take a little bit of time because uh, we have to build the new layer. One thing you might notice is that I'm, I'm being a little bit magic and hand wavy with these magic functions that call vault access and burglass access and KMS decrypt. Um, all of this is open source. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. It's just Seth Vargo slash uh, serverless secrets talk. Um, but my point is that the way that your application gets secrets is an abstraction. Like fundamentally, it is an abstraction. And then the core of the application shouldn't change based off of how you access your secrets. Um, so all this stuff is in here, right? Like here's the code for talking to KMS. Um, here's the code for talking to Vault. Here's the code for talking to Burglass. They're not particularly complicated, and they're only like you know, 10, 15 lines of code. Um, but I'm intentionally doing some hand waving here um, ju just to make it clear that, oh, I broke something. What did I break? The demo was going so well. Cool. This is a great time to take questions. Are there any questions? I will live debug this while there's questions. What's up? Yeah, so um, when you're using uh, like a, a secret broker or, or, or a vault or anything like that, um, do you find that there's uh, concerns about reliability as opposed to like using more native objects like a Canary secret, for example, or, or anything like that that you felt like needs to be provided as a benefit? Yeah, so the question is, uh, if I use a secrets management service that's third party, don't I have to worry about the availability of that service, right? Or one that you built internally. Um, it really depends, right? Security and availability often come with trade-offs. Um, and sometimes they're actually directly competing priorities. Oh, I failed to authenticate the vault. All right, I'll debug that later. Um, it really depends. If you're just using something like Vault or CyberArk for like the key value store, and that's all you're using, then you should probably just use like a native secrets manager or Kubernetes secrets with application layer encryption or something like that. If you're using like the dynamic secrets, though, that's where you start to get a significantly deeper level of security out of those products. So you are trading like an additional overhead for operations and keeping that thing up and running and keeping it moving um, in favor of significantly increased security. But if you're just looking at key value pairs where like you have very static secrets that never change, then it's not likely bringing you like the best benefit that it can. In which case, you should look to just using like a cloud native, cloud space native solution. Don't use Kubernetes secrets. 
Um, so let me elaborate on that. So I have another talk that I've given called Base64 is Not Encryption, um, a better story for Kubernetes secrets. Um, by default, Kubernetes secrets are not encrypted at all. They're stored in plain text and etcd, and the only thing that guards them are RBAC permissions. But if an attacker or an employee gets access to etcd, they have all the secrets in plain text. Um, so because of that, if you're going to use Kubernetes secrets, you should definitely enable what we call application layer encryption using a provider plugin. Um, and again, I have a talk on this that goes into like super deep detail, but there's a mechanism in Kubernetes that lets you encrypt secrets before they go to etcd. In general, though, Kubernetes secrets themselves have a number of challenges. Uh, first, they have to be key value pairs. That doesn't fit everyone's mental model of what a secret needs to be. And second, you're restricted to, again, file system volume mounts or the environment variables. There's a movement in some of the Kubernetes SIGs to move towards um, container storage interface instead, which is a CSI driver. That's actually how Azure Key Vault works. Um, basically, you're mounting a virtual volume um, that every file system call, when you call file.read, for example, that gets mapped to an underlying API call, which is hitting the cloud API. Um, and that's like how the Vault one works as well. Um, and that's kind of like my personally preferred way for doing secrets in Kubernetes. Um, if you are using Kubernetes secrets because it's like a low developer friction thing, you should at least encrypt them using the encryption provider configuration, which is 110 or later. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so bear with me on this one. OK. <laughs> In this particular example, you have a Redis database that is specific to your application. Effectively, the only client that Redis database will ever have is your application, right? gated by access control security groups and whatnot. Why does it need a secret at all? Nobody else can talk to it but your application. Wouldn't it be possible to simplify the whole thing and just say, we already have all the access controls we need. We don't need a secret on top of everything else? Right, so that's kind of what I'm saying with like identity and access management, right? Um, in this example, it's a little bit contrived, right? But I have a publicly available Redis server that uh, only is used by one app. In a real production scenario, I would never publicly expose my Redis, right? So that's an additional layer of protection. Um, additionally, I would have internal firewalls so that only the applications that needed to talk to it um, had those authorized like network policies. Um, even on top of all of that, like even if you have a Redis that is like dedicated to this instance and you have that Redis listen like only on localhost and they run on the same physical machine or they run in like a, the same pod, for example, uh, as like a sidecar container, um, you're probably still going to want to use a password because if an attacker is able to gain access to um, like another pod somewhere in the ecosystem, you want to restrict things as much as possible, right? It's, it's never about preventing an attacker. It's about making it as really hard as possible to get that attacker um, to cause like significant damage and then being able to detect um, any type of infiltration before uh, a large data breach occurs. Other questions? This side of the room can ask questions too. Cool. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you all so much. Well, thank you very much.